Welcome back to the 10th video and really the last video for now about capacitive liquid level sensing. In part 9 I discovered that these capacitive sensors work differently for conductive and non-conductive liquids. Card here, link in the description. And I'm very sorry for that late revelation. It's like, <clears throat> well, a badly written crime novel where only in the last few chapters you are introduced to the actual culprit. Again, sorry for that. This video will start out with a very quick review of the first eight parts where we will have to make maybe some corrections and additions in regards to measuring non-conductive liquids. Afterwards we tie up some loose ends and if time permits we do a little summary of all ten parts at the very end. Enjoy! So. Here's a short recap. In part 1, and you find links to all parts in the description, we covered the basic physics of capacitance and we learned that capacitance is somehow proportional to the permittivity of the isolating material, it's proportional to the area of your electrodes and it's inverse proportional to the length of your electric field lines. Afterwards we did some experiments and we admittedly concentrated on changes of the capacitance of our little experimental sensor setups due to changes of the relative permittivity of the surrounding medium, so water and air in our experiments. And that was clearly a mistake because changes of the relative permittivity are only relevant for really isolating liquids, not for water. As I've discovered far too late, admittedly, in part 9, the changes of capacitance for conductive liquids like water or even slightly conductive liquids like alcohol come from changing the length of the field lines which are basically cut off because the liquid around the sensor acts like another conductive electrode. But at least we covered the physics of that effect, that is that the capacitance is inversely proportional to the length of the field lines in part 1. Part 2 to 6 covered measuring the capacitance, first the basics and then later the analog to digital stuff and it really doesn't matter which effect changes the capacitance you're measuring. In part 7 and 8 we talked about the use of a reference electrode to enable the measurement of liquids with different relative permittivities without the need to recalibrate the whole sensor setup. And there I went down the deep end because we conducted all our experiments with water and saline, conductive liquids. And when you have conductive liquids the changes in relative permittivity do not matter because they work by cutting off the field lines that is shortening the outside field lines around your sensor by acting like another metal sheath, another electrode around your sensor. But anything I told you about the use of referent electrodes and how to minimize the creep of the reference electrode uh, was all true and is applicable. But yeah, <clears throat> just for non-conductive liquids. I have nothing to say about part 9 where we <clears throat> where I actually learned, sorry again, that there are two different mechanisms at work for conductive and non-conductive liquids. Let's tie up the loose ends now, three of them in total. And the first one is about the connections between your sensor and your electronics. 
We already talked about keeping them as short as possible to reduce the capacitance of your sensor setup in air and thus extending its dynamic range. And in addition to avoid picking up or to minimize picking up outside noise, 50-60 Hz mainly. In that context, we also discussed the use of a coax cable for the connection to really shield things from 50-60 Hz noise. However, Jim9930 pointed out to me that this might not be a really good idea after all, because your standard 50 ohm coax cable has a capacitance of about 100 picofarads per meter. With the small capacitances we are handling here, that's enormous. And even if we would use a 100 ohm impedance coax cable, it would only get you down to about 50 picofarads per meter. And then there are yeah, some really specialized 110 ohm, 120 ohm coax cables out there. Very expensive and that could bring you down maybe to 40 or 30 picofarads per meter. Still a lot of capacitance to add to our little setup. So yeah, better not use coax cables in that application. Second, I wanted to talk about the material we are using for isolation. There are two classes of materials and that applies to both liquids and solids. There are polar materials like water and alcohol and they are also called hydrophilic, that is they are attracted to water, or lipophobic, that is they repel fatty stuff. And there are non-polar materials, for example, oil, which are also called hydrophobic, so they repel water, or lipophilic, so they attract fatty stuff. And the thing is, polar materials are attracted to each other and non-polar materials are also attracted to each other, but polar and non-polar materials repel each other. You remember that little experiment where I pulled out the sensor out of the water or alcohol or saline and the readings would go down only very slowly because the liquid was kind of sticking to our isolation material on the outside. And that was water and alcohol are polar and obviously our isolation material here is also polar. So the liquid was sticking sticking to it. I have here a strip of that heat shrink material and if I dunk that into water and pull it out, you can see how long it takes for the water to run off that piece and how it's sticking to it. And yeah, especially there down in the, uh, <laughs> at the corner. And that's because water is polar and obviously that heat shrink stuff is polar. That's a piece of polypropylene pipe and if I put that into the water and pull it out, you see the water is rinsing off really quickly and only some small drops remain on the surface. That's because it's, well, non-polar. That's the outer PVC isolation from a power cord and if I dunk that in, you can see the water is sticking to it quite well. Well, it's black on black, so but, uh, you, you have to believe me. The water is sticking to it, so it's also polar. And finally, I have here a PET or LDPE, so polyethylene bottle, low density polyethylene. And if I dunk that in, yeah, you can see there are, there are only drops left on the surface. So this is also non-polar. So what polymers are polar and which are non-polar? 
I don't know. It seems to be an industry secret. So I never found any table, you know, overview. These are the 250 polymers in industrial use and those are polar and those are non-polar. You really have to do a research for each and every one and hope and hope you stumble about a site or a vendor of that specific polymer that states it's polar or non-polar. And it gets even more complicated. For example, LDP or PET is non-polar while HD, so high density PE, seems to be polar. Uh, polypropylene is non-polar. There we've seen that. The pipe uh, PVC is polar. Polystyrene is non-polar, PTFE is non-polar, PMMA is polar, PC is polar and nylon is polar. And that's all I know, at least for now. And what about liquids? Well, that's simple. If it mixes with water, then it's polar and as the name suggests, hydrophilic. And if it doesn't mix with water, it's non-polar. So hydrophobic, like oil, for example. So if you want to have a sensor that reacts fast in a polar liquid like water, that is uh, the water runs off very quickly, you should use a non-polar polymer for isolation. And vice versa, if you are measuring a non-polar liquid like oil and you want a fast reaction time that is the oil or the diesel oil or whatever should run off fast your isolating material should be polar third I wanted to talk about how I optimized for precision the charge time values and the resistor values Unfortunately, it's fiddling and compromises. We already talked about that lowering the resistor value of our RC element is good for reducing noise. However, if you lower the resistor value, you also have to lower the charge time. Uh, otherwise, yeah, our little capacitance is completely charged up after only a very small time. And you want to keep the charge time in microseconds, at least in that code, reasonably large. Because if you do a delay microseconds of, for example, here 100, that could mean in extremes 99.5 microseconds or 100.5 microseconds. So if you make it, let's say, only <laughs> 10 microseconds uh, the charge time, then you already have an error of plus minus 5% only from the charge time. But there is another consideration. I have here an Excel showing two RC circuit charge curves. The blue here for a tau of one and the red for a tau of 2.66. The exact units and scales really are not important here. What's important is that the relation from 1 to 2.66 is the same change in tau our sensor had here from dry about 30 picofarads to completely vetted about 80 picofarads. The green line here is the difference between the two charge curves. And to get the most accuracy out of your analog to digital converter, that is to use the most of its dynamic range, you want to measure at a point of time where the two charge curves of your dry and your fully vetted sensor have the greatest distance. And this would be if we look at the green curve about here. So I tuned the whole thing that in dry state, we would charge up to about 80% of full scale of my analog to digital converter. Of course, 
if you have a sensor with another dry capacitance to wet capacitance ratio, let's say 1 to 1.5, the optimum time for taking your measurement shifts and therefore the optimum charge level in full scale of your analog to digital converter changes too. Now here it's about 70-75% uh, in that case. And keeping all that in mind you start fiddling around and optimize your resistor values and charge time to get the most out of this setup. Mm, that's it. That's it for today. I think I mentioned in the intro that I will do a summary of the whole 10 videos. They are about five hours or so uh, at the end of this video. But I think that the uh, addendum errata section at the start of this video summarized everything up quite well anyway. And to be frank, I'm... <laughs> A little bit tired now uh, talking about capacitive liquid level sensors and probably so are you. Coming up next, probably a series of simple teardown videos so, to show, so I can recover a little bit. Yeah, I spent most of my spare time the last 10 weeks doing these videos. Anyway, till next time. Bye.